And great to have you here and uh, great to have Myla joining us. And uh, so if we go a little bit in the background, Richard, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, like your interest in entrepreneurship, what you did before this. Yeah. So let's start there and then try to build the journey forward. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, first of all, I'm really grateful for the question to, to come and uh, talk to you. So uh, happy to be here. And uh, yes, so um, I am a medical doctor by trade. Uh, so that's a big part of my background, but I'm also always been an entrepreneur all my life. I'm born and raised in a family business completely different from the startup environment I am in nowadays, but still it was a good school for me to, um, to really understand the core of a good business. Uh, uh, and uh, then personally, I've been driving towards some more uh, purposeful entrepreneurial uh, journey, so to speak. Um, and uh, I mean, it's a lifestyle, so uh, the entrepreneurial part of me is really big. It's um, what I think of most <laughs> on my, on my uh, awake hours. But uh, of course, I, I, it's so important, especially when you work hard, uh, building a company to have time to uh, load the batteries as well, doing fun stuff. And for me personally, it's uh, everything from motorcycles uh, to uh, snowboarding and just being at home, fixing with my house. And um, mostly uh, I, I really prioritize uh, to be with my six-year-old daughter as well. So I, uh, for me personally, it's a... Uh, uh, very clear uh, pri uh, prioritization in my life where health come first both mental and physical and then relationships and family and then it's mindler uh, so it's um, because if i don't have those two in the top in place i can't have the energy to do what i need to do building a company such as uh, mindler so Really interesting that you bring it in uh, a very important point because um, generally when we see people on Twitter, for example, Elon Musk talking like 24 hours working and then all that. And uh, it's, it's really pleasant to hear um, a discussion on where the priority on the startup needs to be because without health, you are nowhere with your relationship without and relationships, you're nowhere with your business. So I think that's a great priority, uh, uh, like that you uh, that you brought in here. What do you think? Like you said that you've been around in the entrepreneurship scene yourself, and startup Stockholm being one of the uh, most innovative and impactful places in the world in terms of developing startups. Why do entrepreneurs, you think, forget the? the softer side of building the own self and relationships and just put entrepreneurship forward. You think there is something wrong with the startup industry or what? Just no, I, I think actually to be successful, you need to be a little bit uh, obsessed with yeah. what you are doing. So it's really a balance between uh, nursing that mm. obsession but also not to forget uh, that there are other things in life that is really important as well. Mm. So, uh, and I must say, I'm not a pro at this, but I try to learn along the way what works, what not work. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I'm really obsessed as well and uh, really, you know, live and breathe what I do, uh, but, uh, you, you need to last for a really long time. So I often, mm. uh, you know, when you look at Formula One cars, you know, mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. extremely powerful, extremely fast, fastest thing, you know, on earth almost, but they need to, you know, go into 
um, pit stop, you know, once <laughs> every number of laps. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the motor will just burn and they want to, you know, a mile more. Mm -hmm. So, so it's important to to balance, you know, to be really uh, productive, energized. But you you can't be that way, you know, forever. You need to have a balance mm -hmm. in life. Otherwise, it 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 won't last. So, and uh, I mean, I'm 45, and I want to continue doing what I'm doing when I'm. 55 and 65 and maybe 75 and to be able to do that and keep the joy in doing uh, the entrepreneurial journeys uh, then you need to find that balance and of course it's individual uh, i think what is that balance for each specific person so okay. um, very interesting point i think that you make about the balance and i think it's up to us as individuals as how we strike that balance so that's a great point and then you are also you brought in, a, in the analogy of the formula one which is which is a very interesting point that you make and and for entrepreneurs out there i think the message here is that you're playing for the long haul so don't forget the long haul because the short haul is only today so so it's yeah. good to have the resilience and the patience and the energy to play a long haul game. So that's yeah. a great point, uh, Rickard. Really appreciate that. Um, going a little bit deeper uh, on the personal side itself, because uh, in the last few years, and I think as entrepreneurship has like uh, expanded so much in all domains and all verticals, uh, there's a lot of uh, advisory services there's a lot of literature coming out that you need to find your why you need to find your pace you need to find your space and the balance as you're talking about how do you as a person achieve that you said that you kind of prioritize your time and so do you have a secret formula like how to switch off switch on like we we'll like to understand that maybe yeah when it comes to like uh, strategy, uh, strategy to build a company i think it's more about just go for it don't mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. too much don't analyze too much uh, mm -hmm. just you know throw yourself out there uh, it's more about courage than anything else mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah so so i mean that's what i do i i, I go with a gut feeling and um, and just go for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't spend too much time on, you know, logos and design and and such. It's it's better to just throw your idea out there. It could be ugly as hell. Decide mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It's more important to see is people willing to use your service or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't that don't need to cost anything almost. So uh, so that's my strategy and, and uh, when it comes to uh, uh, letting the pressure out mm -hmm. I would say uh, it, it's been a, um, a good thing for me to actually work you know 10 years as a medical doctor because if if you can't uh, let go of the patients and what could maybe what you could have missed during the day you wouldn't sleep at all so i think i actually learned during my uh, time as a medical doctor to when i came come home i i try to not think about uh you know what could go wrong or forecasts or business risks or whatever i just uh, leave that out um and how I managed to do that. I, I really don't know. It's just <laughs> some acquired talent, maybe during yeah. during the years. Very interesting. I think uh, you mentioned a very important word there: uh, courage. And I think it takes courage on both sides. If I'm trying to recreate it for all the entrepreneurs here, so so what Ricard is saying is that you have to the uh, you have to have the courage as a startup uh, or an entrepreneur to play with the market, which means throw out your stuff there, because it's like it's like you're playing tennis, for example. So on your side, you have to play. If you don't play, the game stops. 
So, so you yeah. need to keep the game momentum out. So have the courage to throw out stuff, even if it's unfinished, and then see how market reacts. And then you made a very interesting point of courage of letting it go if you want to achieve the balance. So I think courage on both sides for entrepreneurs. Um, let's go a little bit into mindless background. Uh, Ricard, if you could tell our uh, viewers and listeners here, like how did it start? Like and what were the early challenges in building this startup? Yeah, so uh, I, I had some experience from the startup scene, so to speak, because I founded a company called Veer Labs as well, uh, which is quite successful in, in Sweden, uh, doing blood tests and so on. So I, I had some experience from that and also another company called Colivia, which is a uh, platform for healthcare professionals to find work and uh, uh, but I, I i'm really driven by problems that i could you know see and and almost touch uh, and one of the big problems that i saw as a medical doctor and also as a human being was the the need of better uh, treatment for mental health problems. There were so long waiting times and so much suffering and uh, I couldn't bear just looking at it. I, I really wanted to do something. So I started to source uh, potential partners and founder, co-founders um, because I really thought this is going to be something for the long run a big company so i didn't want to do it myself uh, and one day a guy called uh, richard ferdy called me up and he said uh, not knowing that i was really you know into the, this vertical at that time uh, he said that he and a friend of his um, was doing a, a cry for mental health uh, and i said that's great because uh, that's exactly what I, I, I want to do myself. And, and they actually wanted me as a advisor on the advisory board, but I said, let's do this together. Uh, and we had the first meeting and um, it was really good chemistry between us. Uh, they are both psychologists, uh, Johannes Hatem and Richard Ferdig. Uh, so they had a great network of psychologists, uh, me being a medical doctor had some experience. I did know what the clinical reality looked like, which is important. Um, and uh, then we actually, I think we had some kind of startup record because we went from the first meeting in February, 2018 to treat the first patient in April, 2018. So it was two months from first meeting Till we actually start um, treating patients uh, and we are all really really hands-on um, I think it's important to you know just lose the ego lose the prestige I mean uh, I, I did uh, customer success customer support side you know answering questions uh, Rickard and Johannes they were the first psychologists so we could immediately you know try it out uh, and learn from the first patient what works, what not work. And uh, it was also kind of funny because uh, in the beginning, I, every time a, a patient uh, contacted Mindler, uh, I said that, oh, you need to hurry because now we just have two psychologists left with empty time slots. So you need to book really quickly. Uh, and but that, we just had those two, uh, Rickard and Johannes, and from there we just grow organically, more or less. Um, personally, I uh, you know I met so many people telling me that you can't uh, you can't have like a, a, an effective treatment doing this online. It's not possible. You won't find psychologists, uh, and uh, and also there are so there are big competitors with much more money. You will get you know overrun. Uh, but I uh, decided really early on that okay, uh, we will uh, see to it that we will be 
really well financed uh, and and um, I really believed in uh, treating patients online when it comes to mental health in particular um, because of the nature of the treatment uh, that you talk to a psychologist and also lots of the exercises you can do uh, self-help programs everything uh, connected uh, to the treatment is really good uh, to to use the digital context for so uh, and uh, as it turned out it it was uh, quite successful and and we we have grown rapidly from us three to now i think we are around 500 people employed on, on four markets uh, so it's um, it's really great to be a small part of <laughs> of this company saving lives on a daily basis it's uh, really uh, purposeful and uh, fun from a business side as well and of course from a tech side because it's innovation it's a part deep tech company i would mm -hmm, say mm -hmm. Uh, try to revolutionize the treatment um, and make it better uh, and so on so uh, and more data driven as well so so I think we have done a lot for psychological treatments with Mindler so far that's very interesting and very inspiring from three to five hundred people starting in as recently as 2018 so that's that's a great journey just to rewind back a little bit for our listeners i think you made a very interesting point when you started discussing that that you want to work with problems you can see feel touch i think that's very important for entrepreneurs if you are building something the problem should be hugely relevant to you and you should be living in that space because that then reflects when you're pitching your startup that reflects yeah. on your face it reflects on your feelings i think that's very important uh, lesson for our startups that live feel work with the problem on a daily basis second uh, i think it goes back to your belief of throwing things out in the market and checking like when you went ahead and uh, started looking for people you wanted to do it collaboratively i think that's a great feeling many uh, so when i'm advising entrepreneurs i think that's one of the first things that i also focus on that uh, you alone are one but the two or three you could change the world together so having that kind of on the outset and you never know because when you had those meetings you suddenly opens doors to a new uh, set of opportunities and uh, yeah. it's not possible without those meetings and then i yeah. think you talked about the a very important point of having speed and action yeah. focused and tour focus from when we talked about then in two months you went from idea to the first patient stage so that's really really inspiring what's also very important is losing your ego and ego and uh, prestige in that because many times uh, we take on a hat and say okay fine it will happen on its own no go out there and do it so so great learning points there Rekhat. um let's take a diversion here and talk about uh, the mental health how big is the issue how did you become interested in it and what do you think is are we doing enough to solve it together uh, as an ecosystem or a collection of startup or whatever med services are out there how big is the issue and what needs to be done yeah it's uh, i mean the the problem uh, at least in the western world world mm -hmm. is uh, i mean uh, it's the, the figures you will get when you start to you know do the math uh, and look at how many patients and so on it always ends up in you know it, it don't seem realistic because it's uh, such a big market or a problem mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on how you look at it so but but normally most studies uh, say around 10 15 up to 20 percent uh, of the uh, population uh, suffering from some kind mm -hmm. of mental health problem but it it don't need to be that severe it could be insomnia or uh, any kind of anxiety problem or problem in a relationship or mm -hmm. or more severe problems like uh, depression and uh, uh, or psychiatry like uh, schizophrenia bipolar mm -hmm. disorder mm -hmm. and so on so it's a it's a broad spectrum of uh, problem symptom diagnosis 
um, but it's uh, it's really a big um, problem that I think uh, we're just about to address um, in a more um, with a more with a clearer view mm -hmm. because uh, I mean it's been uh, surrounded by stigma so yeah. it's uh, it's not uh, something that uh, people uh, seek help um, mm -hmm. for uh, not at the first step anyway normally it it uh, takes a long time before a person seeks help for mental health problem they think it should you know just pass of its own uh, and so on mm. so uh, and i think the suffering uh, when it comes to mental health uh, issues i mean it's it could even be greater than you know having cancer or anything like mm. that because of the stigma uh, because of the uh, people are you know ashamed of having mm. these kinds of problems so uh it's and also it's not affecting just the individual it's affecting you know everyone around mm. that individual so it's uh, uh it, it becomes a, a, an even bigger problem from that aspect and yeah. uh, and i believe you know at any workplace if you have like a co-worker with a depression or anything like that it don't necessarily means that that person will you know be on a sick leave at home but they could be at the office but not being productive mm. maybe end up in conflict or whatever and uh, so it's it's a big problem from many different aspects and i think uh, from a startup uh, perspective it's uh, so many things still left to do um i would say so uh, and it's everything from peer-to-peer -peer services you know one mm -hmm. individual supporting another one and uh, to more healthcare um positioned companies such as mindly for example mm. um and even more um advanced um companies maybe uh, combining uh, pharmaceutical treatments with digital services and uh, uh, in uh, and uh, some different tests and uh, so on so it's um, yeah it's yeah lots to do still so, so what i hear is the problem is uh, is quite big and also the impact on let's say domains like workplace uh, workplace yeah. is also huge and at the same time there is at times resistance or shyness on the person's part to go out and seek and that's where probably the traditional healthcare system which is a lot of personal interaction based like going seeking an appointment visiting and then there's a system of cues i don't know how big that problem is in the psych uh in the mental health space like uh, yeah. the queuing up of public health care system do we have any uh, yeah yeah three months uh, around the three months um, to, to to have a psychology uh, to get in contact with a psychologist uh, it's up to three months okay in sweden in sweden so and that's uh, pretty much the same when you look at the netherlands or germany or uk okay it's, it's long waiting times overall and it could be quite uh, different in different regions as well because maybe well resourced centralized regions have access to uh, access to healthcare practitioners which can help at several levels but i'm not sure what happens in smaller towns no exactly and that's uh, also a strong side uh, using a digital uh, mm. media because uh, all of a sudden for example Mindler in Sweden we have psychologists speaking more than 20 different countries okay. and there are experts on um, or specialists in uh, everything from PTSD to you know social phobia or whatever and that means that if you live in the northern part of Sweden mm -hmm. where in a small city maybe you have a local health center with two psychologists but chances are that 
they are not specialized in whatever problem you have. But if you see Mindler or any other similar company, you as a patient will have access to a broader range of specialists or even um, find a psychologist speaking your uh, native uh, language, for example. So, so it's, um, that's a really big benefit, uh, I would say, mm. uh, working with ser services like Mindler. And, and also the data uh, driven aspect of it, because okay. we can use um, every patient that we will treat uh, using uh, the Mindler platform we will get data helping the ne next patient to, to get okay. an even even better treatment. Uh, and I mean, we treat around 1000 patients per day. Um, and that uh, means that we have, you know, we could conduct like five major clinical studies every day if we wanted to um compared with a uh, traditional uh, study uh, mm. at a university it's maybe 100 200 uh, participants and i mean we have 1000 patients per day so it, it gives us uh, so many opportunities to really take a traditional kind of care and make it data driven and more modern and better with a better outcome and and that will be also really important going into the future because the uh, demand is just growing but the taxes that states will receive are at the same level so the money need to you know last longer and that means that you need to provide treatments that are much better than today more effective with a better outcome you know time effective cost effective uh, and so on so so it's really important to drive the development uh, when it comes to treatment of mental health problems uh, otherwise i think we will see a even bigger problem than today uh, going into the future a couple of years okay Okay, very interesting points, Rickard, and I think we we touched on like what are the key areas and how Mindler solves the problem. And we talked about first of all is access, which is solved through a digital platform. Uh, second is the speed itself. Like instead of those three months waiting queues, you have a much shorter process over here. And then the level of support because you have specialists and people plugged in from several different areas. So the support level is really uh, well serviced uh, for the client needs. And the last point, the thousand data points you talked about, the data driven. So I think this is all really interesting. If we, so I'm trying to understand like, for our listeners, it will be interesting to know a little bit more about how Mindler works. And then we can take a set of questions on your startup building journey, like some uh, advice or some learning points there. So if we talk about my, uh, like how Mindler works, um, what I'd like to probably understand and community, of course, here would be that how are these uh, practitioners connected? Is it that you kind of are a for meddling or a kind of a matchmaking platform, or are you something beyond that when it comes yeah. to the 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 healthcare uh, provider on this side, somebody who is offering the service to help the uh, help the people on the other side and the people? So I think that point, if you could elaborate. Yeah, sure. So the psychologists they are employed, so it's. Okay. Uh, uh, our psychologists. So we are not um, uh, a platform in that sense, more like a digital online clinic, I would say. Okay. Um, and given the size of the problem globally, 1.8 billion uh, people in need of some kind of mental health, health treatment. With that fact, we understood quite immediately that uh, the psychologists it won't be enough psychologists to treat all of those patients. So we need to um, find a way to use each psychologist in the best uh, possible way. 
So each psychologist can treat as many people, patients as possible without, you know, getting burn up, burned out themselves. So uh, with that in the back of our heads, mm-hmm. we came up with a mildly blended treatment, which means that you have video sessions with psychologists combined with um, uh, the ICBT programs. And ICBT programs, they are like online courses focusing on different diagnoses or symptoms. Uh, you could look at it as an, different exercises as well that you do with or without the support of the psychologist. Um, so the combination is really powerful and uh, that makes us uh, able to provide the best and, and the really high quality treatment, uh, but in a more effective way when it comes to time spent with each uh, psychologist. Uh, so so it's um, a service really based on psychological expertise com- combined with technical innovation. So we really try to, you know, get the best from both worlds together mm. uh, here at Mindler to be able to provide a, a, a high quality treatment in the end. Okay. And this okay. we are just in the beginning doing this. So I think uh, we will see lots of the de- development going on and uh, I mean, the the, um, the exercises are getting more and more interactive. Uh, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. in the end, it's really important to, you know, really empower the patient to, to mm-hmm. get motivated and really take a responsibility of their own treatment um, and uh, get the engagement and so on. So uh, that's okay. what we are working on a lot right now. Okay, v- very interesting. Um, one of the questions which startups at any stage get is uh, like, what is the monetization model? Like, how yeah. does Mindler actually survive as a business? And um, so, Sweden being a welfare state, of course, medical expenses to a great extent are subsidized by the state. So, in the Swedish context, how does this work? for Mindler to actually run a purposeful business? Yeah, I would say actually it's kind of hard in Sweden because they have lowered the reimbursement. Uh, so they mm-hmm. have lowered it to a level where it's, uh, uh, it's, it's getting harder and harder actually. Uh, but it's also, uh, we are also really grateful for the Swedish healthcare system, because mm. without it, we couldn't, you know, uh, grow at all. So it's a okay. it's a balance there, and and it's also that's uh, a little bit complicated when it comes to um, uh, business models, because I mean, in Sweden, it's public reimbursement. Mm-hmm. In the Netherlands, mm-hmm. it's um, insurance companies, and we also have a private pay offers in uh, the British market, for example. And on top of that, we have a B2B model as well. So uh, you need to be really flexible uh, with, and it's not just mind, it's every mm-hmm. healthcare uh, kind of setup or service uh, because the, the systems are, it's quite fragmented when you look at Europe uh, and mm-hmm. there are lots of different uh, healthcare system. But for, for us, I mean, we are, the, the psychologists are the same, the minor platform is the same, the patient is the same, but you need to be flexible when it comes to who is paying for it. Uh, so uh, just to bear that in mind, uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, possible to, to really grow a healthcare company on the European market, for example. That's a very interesting point that you make. And I believe Mindler is now expanding into other markets. You mentioned about like monetization is one thing. Once you are out of the geography, expanding to new countries, monetization models might be different for a healthcare player. Language might also be different. What kind of constraints or challenges that puts those things put on a startup, for example? 
because you are still learning your journey, expanding yeah. from three to five hundred, but maybe going much farther. Yeah. Is that a challenge? Does it mean that you need to localize a lot, or you need to have localized teams? How do you address that as a mindler? Uh, such challenges. Yeah, it's um, absolutely. It, it, it is a challenge, but uh, one of the reasons that we want to work with licensed psychologists um, is that the, the education is quite similar. So a psychologist working in, um, you know, in Spain uh, and been trained and educated in Madrid have quite similar education as the Swedish psychologist. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a standard set working with licensed psychologists so that that's been really helpful then um, the the actual golden standard when it comes to treatment could be a little bit different on different mm -hmm. markets so we need to be flexible and adapt to to different uh, traditions and so on so it's a it's a balance between uh, doing what we are doing best, uh, which is uh, combined, uh, you know, the psych uh, psychological expertise with uh, digital treatment tools. Um, but uh, we also need to adapt to, to each market a little bit um, doing so. So uh, and it depends. I mean, we have an office in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that in in the Netherlands, uh, um, the healthcare is paid through insurance companies, uh, and they have you know um, regulations that we need to adapt to. And one is that we need to have a local team, uh, for example. So we have that uh, in Amsterdam. In, um, for example, UK, we, we just uh, we have a few individuals working for Mindler, but we don't have any office or anything there because up to the up until this point we, we don't need it. We can do uh, everything from the Stockholm office, so it's really really flexible and it's not like one size fits all kind of thing. Uh, not doing what we are doing at least. Uh, with the with the um, healthcare uh, service, uh, it's uh, you need to really adapt to each market. And I would like to mention that uh, the B two B offering mm -hmm. is a little bit easier because that is a business model that is quite similar on every market. So it's not you know a big difference between our B two B offering on the French market uh, compared mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. uh, Swedish B2B offering, for example. But when it comes to B2 government, then you need to adapt a lot uh, to each market. Okay. Explain B2B a little bit for our audience. Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a company health offering. Mm -hmm. So we, mm -hmm. we do have an offering for companies uh, providing... Um, mental health um, treatment and also uh, proactive uh, treatment. I call it a vaccine for mental health um, issues. Okay. Um, so it, it's a model where the company pay uh, 99 crowns per individual or employee per month. Uh, okay. And then they get access to both the ICBT programs and also uh, video sessions with psychologists. So uh it's uh, a company help offering okay very interesting let's jump into some other dimensions of the startup so you recently raised a large funding round uh, earlier this year how has the experience yeah. like starting from your first like you uh, when you met in 2018 and of course you raised your finances how challenging it has been raising uh, the successive funding rounds and what do you think worked in your case which you could share with our audience who are entrepreneurs change makers for their learning yeah yeah i i mean it i think it's uh, to start with uh, with mindler we decided really early on to bring on investors to bring in vc companies 
Okay. Um, and um, the reason for that is that with um, good investors, you also need a good structure in the company. Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, have a good data room. You need to have the numbers in order. Uh, and lots of stuff that I think is really important if you want to, you know, grow a really, really big company. And also, I do know from entrepreneurial friends that some are scared of uh, letting, you know, investors in. Uh, they are afraid to lose control. And I, I hear a lot, lot of different things that they are afraid of. But my mm -hmm. experience is that an investor will never take control of your company because they want you to run the company because you mm. are the one knowing what is best for your, your company. So, uh, and also, um, I think about you know being diluted and so on. That's also something that I hear a lot. Oh, mm. uh, you know, it will be so much dilution bringing the investors on board and and so on, and. Uh, I mean, in the end, it, it depends on what kind of focus you have. If the focus is to just, you know, build the world's best, uh, you know, med tech company mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. with Mindler, then it doesn't matter how much, you know, how big part you own in the end. You either will be successful building that company and then I can promise you that you will, you know, be really happy uh, with the shares you you have uh, or you will fail and then it doesn't mm. matter anyway so so i personally have kind of an aggressive uh view on you know raising money so um i want mainly to be well financed i want you know investors to join because i look at it as a bigger team that wants mm. Mindler to be successful. It's more friends, it's more support. Uh, so that's uh, one aspect. And, and then when it comes to actually raising money, I think, uh, I mean, you, you need to be able to show some, you know, growth figures. You yeah. need to show that hockey stick or at least a, a really uh believable story about how you will make money in the future if you are not making it right now um and uh, and of course it's it's really good if you are uh if you have i mean timing is uh, important um and uh, for mindler working with mental health issues i think uh something we're just about to change when it comes to the view of mental health issues in the world and in sweden so we had really good timing and and that i mean that obviously have helped us raising money combined with the growth figures you know pointing upwards mm. uh, and and also uh, i think it's important to show that is not just about uh, treating each patient today. It's about no learning uh, every day how to, you know, uh, be able to offer an, an even better treatment tomorrow. So it, I would say that for Mindler, it's a combination between a traditional fast growing startup and a deep tech company actually providing that technology to, to actually revolutionize the, the the way you you think about treatment uh, in four or five years so so you you need to really you know have a clear view of the vision but also do a reality check and look at the numbers today and in your past and it's a combination of all that uh, and if you have it in place then you will be able to raise money successfully okay very interesting points and um, i'll just recap it for our audience you, you said have an aggressive uh, fundraising strategy for your startup that helps you get uh, more advisors more different perspectives it becomes your extended team and don't be afraid of uh, being diluted because if you succeed 
it doesn't matter you will succeed so so i think that's a very interesting point and then you made a very interesting point on showing something be ready to show something no this could be results but if you don't have results or revenue show the story so i think that's yeah. that's a very interesting point for our startups joining in and timing point is also very relevant here that whatever you are working on check around do are you in the sweetest spot of the time for example for that technology or that problem is it in the mainstream uh, in terms of getting traction and finally about talking about tomorrow always like focusing on the big vision so i think great points over there uh, when you launch the startup what help you get the traction like of course you said that it was a very hands on focus with the team so you were out there customer success manager and all but yeah. what actually what was the formula that worked like the, you built this uh, network of people seeking the help and people willing to offer the help what get that yeah, got that i think that's one of the key challenges uh, in early stage stage uh, startup mm. to and it comes back to the courage because you will end up most startups will end up in a situation where you have you have built some kind of mvp or a platform um, and you believe in your service and maybe you have some money and it's scary to put that money on marketing because you won't know if you will just throw it away or if it will be a, a good investment but you do know mm. that if i spend half a million on marketing and it w won't be successful then we are almost out of business yeah. um, so so for us uh, it was actually about spending those money on marketing oh, yeah. and really you know put ourselves out there showing that now you can you know get this kind of service within 24 hours speak to a psychologist online and mm -hmm. uh, it, it was scary uh, and and the cac the customer acquisition cost was really high in the beginning mm -hmm. as it should be for a new company uh, but um, it's worth it because uh, i mean some startups they are great when it comes to pr and they will get publicity and everything not spending you know one euro on nothing and i mean great for them i'm not that way I, I i do it the more traditional way just marketing the hell out of the mm. <laughs> the service and 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 it's also really important because it's, it's hard to really uh, get the feedback about your product if you don't have users using the product so so it's important from that aspect as well to get really early on a lot of users so you will know what you need to change uh, to make the product better uh, so yeah excellent points excellent points we'll go rapidly i know we are closing on to the last five minutes uh, we'll uh, i'll go into some of the audience question here so laurie has a question regarding data and understanding mental health challenges with different populations in sweden do you have any insights of what populations are having these challenges mental health challenges or what data are allowed to be collected on demographics and how can that inform uh, mental health public policy yeah i, I think um I, i'm not have, having the data top of mind uh, mm -hmm. regarding geographical uh, differences and so on uh, but overall, I would say uh, it's not that uh, mental health uh, issues are similar with any somatic uh, disease. Uh, so it's, I mean, uh, it, every kind of individual can get, you know, cancer. Uh, mm. And it's pretty much the same with mental health issues. Uh, it, it, it don't, you know, it's not correlate. Uh, as much with uh, uh, income or where you live and so on. Uh, but of course, different diagnoses could, uh, uh, could um, different uh, people will get different diagnoses, but it's quite, you know, well spread <laughs> okay. Um, okay. throughout, so. Okay, 
but we hopefully we will get lots of data and um, of course uh, when you collect data especially when it comes to medical data it's um, uh, it's not, not uh, something that you just can do uh, you it's regulated what you can do and what you can't do and uh, so on so uh, it's lots of regulation surrounding okay. uh, data but uh, it's something that we are also I think it's important for us, you know, we, we, we take the, uh, we started from a clinical reality. So both for, for me uh, and uh, the other two co-founders, it's, uh, we do have a good understanding surrounding what data you can use and not, and it, it comes with the trade, so, so to speak. So it's make it makes it a little bit easier for us to navigate through the regulations got it uh, then we have a question from michael uh, he has does mindler have psychologists who have experience in uh, the creative sector arts culture workers i think the broader question here is uh, is some sort of sector specialization needed or is there in place uh, in mindler for psychologists different work situations or verticals yeah I, I would say you know with 400 and i think 20 or something psychologists we would cover you know almost everything okay. <laughs> every sector uh so the answer is yes okay hi richard would uh, would you say so victoria has a question would you say that each patient gets the chance to learn more about their particular diagnosis through the icbt system that you have implemented in mindler like do patients get to know more through the system yes yes and that's actually the idea with the programs it's called psychoeducation and uh, it's ev uh, an evidence-based treatment where you actually teach the patient more about the condition and that will help the patient uh, to to cope uh, with whatever symptom uh, or diagnose in a much better way. So, so the answer is yes. Okay. We are on the dot right now. I'll take one more over here question. What kind of tech did you use in beginning to create your MVP? Yes. And <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually need to relieve that, um, that we used a white label solution. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the reason that we could, you know, go from the first meeting to uh, treat the first patient in just two months. So we used a white label uh, solution to mm -hmm. get uh, proof of concept, perfect, you know, product market fit and so on. And then uh, with that knowledge, we build our own platform. So that came actually one year later. Uh, the platform we have today that is in-house built brilliant brilliant excellent so again a good advice to start up which i think locks back to what you were saying like speed action is where things are if you are learning from the market your chances of success are much higher so so i yeah. think great point to end the discussion um a big thank you to ricard and uh, to minder for being here for a very interesting topic a very deep discussion on several aspects we really appreciate uh, this opportunity uh, that we had at uh, startup grind stockholm community a big thank you to all the community members who joined in and will later be watching it on our digital platforms thank you all and we can all grab some lunch now <laughs> thank you so thank much. thank you very much thank you take good care of yourself. bye, -bye.